have your Bibles with you this morning, I'm going to be reading from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, and then from the book of Proverbs. Stand with me, with respect to the Word of God. Reading from the 30th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, one of the clearest and one of the most well-known sections of our Old Testament. Chapter 30, beginning at verse 15, and this is God speaking to Israel. <coughs> See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve thee, or serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. And then from the 8th chapter of the book of Proverbs. We'll begin reading at verse 32. Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my door. For whosoever findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word and to bow our heads. We thank you as always for your word, Lord. Pray that you will use it to speak to our hearts this morning. For that we'll thank you. Amen. You may be seated. The God of our Bible whether it be in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, or in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, has always sat before man a choice. Matter of fact, there's never been a time in history when that was not true, even if you go clear back to the Garden of Eden. The choice has always been a simple choice. And it has always been a clear choice. As spelled out there in Deuteronomy 30, 15, he says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. And the choice has always been a choice between life and death and good and evil. And life always goes with good, and death always goes with evil. 
It always boils down to a choice between obeying God and what He says or not obeying God. In all these years that man has been around, there's never been a time, including now, where God forced anybody to do either one. Notice what verse 19 says. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, please choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. That means... Your kids, your grandkids, choices you make are going to affect them. God lays out the alternatives for each choice and then allows us to choose which one we want. Now think about it. Anybody that ever says God is not fair, how much fairer could you ever get than that? God says, here it is. You can have whichever one you want. Good or evil. Blessing or cursing. I'm laying it right out there. There it is. All you have to do is choose which one you want. So, next time somebody tells you God is not fair, you remind them of that. It could never be any fairer than that. Verse 16 says that if you choose to follow the Lord and you do what He says, that God will give you life and blessings. Won't just happen by accident, but only as you make the choice for it. And verse 17 gives us the other choice. Turn away from God. Don't do what He says. Serve other gods. Do it your way, and God will denounce you so that you perish. Now, when you really think of it logically, that's not much of a choice. <laughs> when, you, when you really think about it in those terms, uh, what do you want? Blessed or cursed? You have either one you want really doesn't take too much of a genius to, to see what would be the, the wise choice there. Yeah, but that's the Old Testament preacher. Don't you know God loves everybody? Well, I was under the impression that God loved everybody in the Old Testament, too. Amen. That's right, amen. <coughs> but the choice to either love God and follow His commandments has always been ours. Amen. In both Testaments. Yep. And in the New Testament, the choice between life and death now focuses upon Jesus. And the choice we must make concerns itself completely with Him. John 1.4 says, God says, you want life? Choose life. John 1.4 says, in Him was life. And he was the light of man. So if you want life, you have to choose Jesus. John 3, 16 through 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, that's a choice, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he that believeth on him, that's a choice, is not condemned, but he that believeth not, and believing not to believe is a choice as well, he's condemned already. John 3.36 says, he that believeth on the Son had everlasting life. God says, I set before you life. Well, if you want it, you've got to believe on the Son. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
I am the life. Here's the choice. You want life? You've got to choose me. No man cometh to the Father, but through me or by me. And John wrote in John 20, 31, These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. That's how you get it. You choose Him. And the life goes with Him. Now those and many other verses clearly tell us that the choice between life and death now rests on what we do with Jesus. If we accept and if we follow Jesus, we have life. And if we choose to reject Him, we choose death. And we will have chosen to live hopelessly and eternally in hell. But it's always a matter of choice. Don't ever think otherwise. You're not predestined to anything. It's always a matter of your choice. Now the writer of the Proverbs we read interjects some more interesting comments to this discussion. He says in verse 33, Be wise and refuse it not. Meaning, don't refuse God's offer of favor and life. And again, it shouldn't take too much of a genius to see that that is the wise choice. There's a wise choice that we, we can make, or a dumb choice. Uh, you can have whichever one you want. You can do whatever you want. But he says it'd be wise to take the choice of life that God offers. Well then, why aren't more people being wise and choosing to follow <coughs> Jesus, and choosing to have life. That's a question you hear asked quite often by people. A good question. And there's actually a very simple answer to it. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. But before we blame the devil too much, consider the words of Proverbs 8.36. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. The devil can and does deceive and blind people to the truth. But if we make the wrong choice, it was not the devil that wronged our soul. We wronged our own soul. We're responsible for it. You're responsible for your choice, not the devil. And there is no one any blinder than the person who has rejected Jesus after he'd come face to face with him and then chosen to be blind. Matter of fact, the blindest people in our community are not the drunks and the dopers and those that were not raised in the church and they don't know any better. The blindest people in the community, this community and any community, are those people who have been a part of a church like ours. <coughs> They've heard the truth. They know the truth. And yet they choose to reject it. And the devil has a field day with them. He makes actually first class fools out of them. And I believe the hottest places in hell will be reserved for those who had a lot of light. They knew better. And yet they chose to defiantly walk against God saying, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to do it my way. How many people do you know just like that that have come and gone through the doors of this church? Probably every other evangelical church in the community. 
And they become the blindest people in the community. They know the truth. They know life is offered. But they choose to reject it. Now, in the final part of Proverbs 8.36, there's another very interesting little tidbit. He says, All they that hate me love death. God says you can have death if you want, or you can have life. But then here he says, all they that hate me love death. Very scary the way a lot of people that you and I know talk and think today. There's no fear of God in them. There's no fear of, of going to hell. Matter of fact, if you listen to a lot of the lyrics of the music they listen to, you'll notice that hell and suicide and, and death are often glamorized by their favorite rock star or sometimes even their favorite country star. A lot of the rockers actually have been singing now for a couple decades that it's going to be party time down there when they get to hell. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Not right, not. Absolutely nothing could be farther from the truth. But all they that hate me love death, the scripture says. Clearly the validity of that scripture can be seen in our own country today. Specifically with the abortion issue. Now this time of year, gun control and the abortion issue usually get a lot of attention because it's soon going to be election time. This is an off year, meaning there's no presidential election or senators or governor or anything from our state. Although with all the campaigning for president for next year's election, it sure doesn't seem like it's an off year, does it? I mean, they shouldn't even allow them to start till the first of the year. That's, I'm so sick of it uh, already. But this is an off year. But gun control and the abortion issue, they just won't go away. And the devil's crowd won't be happy until they take all our guns away from us so that we can't defend ourselves. Nor will they be happy if we were somehow able, by a miracle of God, to overturn Roe versus Wade. They'd be furious if we were ever to, able to do that. Now it's important for us to see that abortion is not just a political issue, it is both a moral as well as a spiritual issue. Our acceptance of and the legalization of abortion means that we as a people, now think of this, we as a people approve of the murder of our very own baby. Amen. It means we have sanctioned death and murder and said it's okay. I don't care how you cut it, I don't care what your politics are, anything like that, to be in favor of abortion or to vote for or to fight for, to keep it legal, means you love death. Amen. That's right. Amen. And Proverbs 8.36 spells it out clearly that all they that hate me love death. Now to watch those tapes from Planned Parenthood, the people laughing over dinner as they drank a glass of wine or chewed on their steak or whatever it was while they casually talk about selling baby body parts, that shows us just how callous 
accepting abortion will make you. Even as a Christian, you have to guard your soul. You have to fight against it, it affecting you. Because our whole society is becoming even more callous each and every day that abortion remains legal. You see, getting used to abortion, what was it, 1973? How many were born after 1973? That means your entire life you have known nothing but legalized abortion. And being used to that has a numbing effect on our consciousness and on your emotions. You just get used to the fact that we kill babies. Now we're all entitled to our own opinion for whatever that's worth. But God is clearly pro-life. Amen. You can yeah. say whatever you want, but God is clearly pro-life. And I can't imagine how you can call yourself a real Christian and you could possibly be in favor of abortion. Lots of people who say they are Christians are in favor of it. But that all by itself ought to tell you something about their spiritual life. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Because all they that hate me yeah. love death. Now in the Old Testament, there were various references to the killing of babies as a part of satanic religion. Pagan religion. That was clearly against God and the Bible. God was angered many times with Israel because they fell into Baal worship. They built groves and altars to burn incense and to even sacrifice their babies to Canaanite deities, one of the worst was Moloch. Not Baal. Baal was bad enough, but one of the worst ones was Moloch. Turn over to 2 Kings chapter 16. Give you a moment to catch up. 2 Kings 16. Begin reading at verse 2. <coughs> it says, 20 years old was Ahaz. Remember what a wicked king he was. 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father, but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel Yea, and look what it says he did. He made his son to pass through the fire. According to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places, and on the hills, and under every green tree. Now you can find references like that in various places in the Old Testament. But when it says here in verse 3 and in other places that Ahaz made his son to pass through the fire, what that means is that he killed his own baby boy. And he sacrificed him to Moloch, the god, by having his own son burned alive. What I understand of uh, accounts of what they would do with Moloch, they would heat the statue of Moloch up, and then they would lay the baby on the statue, and it would burn it to death. Now if you go over to 2 Kings 
chapter 23, verse 10. There, King Josiah had set out to purge Judah of these pagan abominations, the killing of their baby. It says, and he defiled Topeth. That was a place which is in the valley of Hinnom. He defiled it so that no man might make his son or daughter to pass through the fire to Moloch. In other words, he put a stop to the practice so that no more children were allowed to be sacrificed, burnt to death, in the valley of Hinnom as sacrifices to the, the Canaanite god Moloch. Now, when we got to the New Testament, Jesus used the word Gehenna 11 times as he spoke. And each and every time it was translated in your King James Bible, hell. It was Gehenna that he used. Uh, for instance, in Matthew 10, 28, he said, Rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He used the word Gehenna there. And they translated it hell. Gehenna meant this valley of Hinnom. Where they sacrificed their babies to Moloch. And Jesus said hell would be like that. Now, when Jesus was alive, it was a place of continuous fire. That's where they took the garbage from Jerusalem out and burned it, and there was a continuous fire there. You just brought it out and dumped it on the pile, and it just, whatever it was, and there was just constant burning there when Jesus was alive. And it was at the exact same spot where they sacrificed their children to Moloch a half a millennium before. And Jesus used that word, Gehenna, 11 times, and he said, hell will be like that. A place of continuous burning of fire. <clears throat> Thank God no babies that have been aborted go to hell. They all go to hell. Amen. Amen. Yeah. There won't be any babies that end up there in that respect. But in America, just like they did in the, with Moloch, we too have turned far from God. To validate just how far we have turned from God to paganism, we only need to look to the abortion clinics. There, no matter how you cut it, we are sacrificing our babies to heathen gods. All we want to dress it up real nice and call it birth control. Or say it should be a woman's right to do with her own body whatever she chooses. Okay, but when does the baby get to choose? Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. The false gods of Canaan and Babylon demanded child sacrifice. Perhaps that was also their way of solving the problem of unwanted babies. But this same ancient horror is now upon us. And again, we have grown accustomed and used to it. Especially if you've been born after 1973, you don't know anything in this country but that. I remember, and many of you remember a day when that was illegal. I tried, amen. When we said it was horrendous. Where we didn't sanction it. I see abortion as a spiritual issue. Not a political issue. And it is a sign that we as a people have turned far away from the true God Amen. and His way. 
It's not a stretch to say that I see the abortion clinics as the groves or altars where the sacrifices are being done. They were made all across Israel. They built groves and altars for that purpose. And hear me. We talk about how America needs a revival. America could never, not in a million years, we could never have a genuine revival. I mean a genuine revival. I don't mean just hopping around and hollering and all this stuff that passes for revival today. We could never have a genuine revival in America without shutting down the abortion industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it just absolutely will not happen. It cannot happen. When they shut down slavery, they had a real revival in America. And we can never again have a real revival in America. I mean, a real one. That reaches out into the entire country without shutting down the abortion industry. And I see no difference between a saline solution abortion, burning the skin off of an unborn baby, that's what they do with a saline solution abortion. They burn the skin off of an unborn baby. I see no difference between that and what the pagans of the Old Testament did burning their children as a sacrifice to Moloch. Thank God, saline abortion, solution abortion is not near as popular worldwide as it used to be. Now we have more popular methods of Planned Parenthood where they do everything they can to kill the baby but save all the organs. So they can sell them. All they that hate God love death. And no matter how you slice it, the acceptance of abortion is a clear statement that we as a people hate God. You say, I don't. I don't either. But the fact that we have accepted it, says that we hate God. Yet God continues to set before us today a choice, life or death, spiritual life or spiritual death. And the God of heaven is not somebody up there just waiting to hit us with lightning bolts or to bring his wrath upon us. The God who is in heaven is hoping that even yet we will choose life. Amen. And the opportunity for you to choose life through Jesus is still available today. Choose life, he says. You say, well, I, I choose to be pro-life. Well, then you ought to be on the side of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because he's life. He's life unto the soul of That little chorus says, My Jesus, my Jesus. By choosing him, we choose life. And God's prayer and my prayer for every one of us under the sound of my voice this morning would be that we would do what Deuteronomy says. Choose life. Choose blessing that goes with it yet. Think of the only other option. Death and cursing. Which would you rather have? Life and blessing. Death and cursing. You say, who would be dumb enough to choose death and cursing? You know probably a couple hundred people that have been dumb enough to choose death and cursing instead of life and blessing. And your job as you go from this place 
this week as you go to work, you go to school, you go to wherever you go. Your job is to try to show somebody through your life, through Jesus living in you, that he has something better to offer them than what they have. Let's stand. Bow our head. Now I would pray that you would choose life and not death. I dare say most of you here this morning probably have already made that choice for life. But understand whether you made it for life, you've made a choice. However you slice it, you've made a choice. And if you chose death, you won't have anybody to blame but yourself. Let's bow our heads as we join together in a closing word of prayer. May God help us all as we go from this place that even in the everyday decisions of life that we will choose life and blessing over death and cursing. Lopes, would you please dismiss us with prayer?